It's a real pleasure to me to introduce uh, an old and a dear, not that old, uh, <laughs> friend. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, ex-colleague Amr Hamzawi, uh, who uh, was an important figure here at Carnegie and is even more important today. Uh, as you know, Amr is today a member of the Egyptian parliament. Uh, he's the president and the founder of the Egypt Freedom Party. And he's only uh, one of a handful of people who made it in the first round to the Egyptian parliament, uh, won outright without the need to go uh, to a second round, which uh, gives us uh, true uh, uh, pride um, in welcoming Amr back to his old home at Carnegie. Uh, we thought uh, that we would start by giving Amr a chance to give us uh, an idea about what is going in Egypt now. A lot of uh, anxiety. Uh, I'm sure Amr has already uh, met with uh, a large number of American uh, Egyptians and others in this town. There is already, as you can tell, a lot of anxiety from last year. The euphoria of last year has given way to uh, a lot of uh, really anxiety about the future of Egypt. Where is it heading? Is democracy working? Is the transition working? Uh, how are the secular and the Islamist parties doing, etc.? So, Amr, uh, why don't we start by giving you a chance to give us an idea about this? And I thought then we would have a discussion with Amr's also old colleague, Marina, uh, uh, who have done together a lot of work on both secular uh, parties and the Islamist parties at Carnegie before. Uh, what has been your experience? Uh, has reality been different from uh, uh, the research that has uh, been done before and other uh, issues that uh, we are all interested in hearing about? So without further ado, Amr, let me welcome you to Carnegie and ask you to give us an idea about what is going on. Sure, please. Thank you very you much. Speak from here. If, I, if I can say, uh, if, you, 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 okay. you can do okay. it. Stop to try. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you allow me to pass. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We will. <laughs> Marwan, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to be back uh, in, uh, in 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 the endowment where uh, where I worked for uh, four years, uh, working jointly with colleagues. Uh, such as Marina Ottaway sitting to my left, and uh, Marwan uh, Maashar and Tom Carosas, whom uh, I cannot see. And uh, so I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm sending him uh, my regards in case I do not see him right after uh, the event. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to be back. I uh, have been in, in, uh, in touch with Marina and Marwan throughout the last uh, 18 months since I uh, started my political career in Egypt and have been following uh, Carnegie research and Carnegie writings, uh, be it coming out of Washington, D.C. or coming out of the Middle East Center in Beirut, where I did serve for a year as well with Paul Salem, Ibrahim Saif, and other colleagues. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be back, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Now let me, let me briefly uh, try to outline uh, how the situation uh, has been evolving uh, in Egypt, and maybe focus on four, four facts and, and try to see whether the four facts taken together uh, do, make, um, um, do make out for a positive development in terms of democratic transition, which is bound to be messy, which has been messy as a process everywhere, not only in Egypt, in Eastern European countries, in Latin American countries, and in Asian and African countries. So the fact that we are looking at a messy process does not tell us much, because democratic transitions are messy, and they are not stable, and a great deal of anxieties among citizens, uh, degeneration of institutional capabilities, and so on and so forth. But I'm going to outline four facts and then see whether taken together, they um, tell us uh, whether Egypt is heading in the right direction or... Turn it off. Uh, sure. Sorry. I have there to is a cell I have, phone I have, I have to turn my cell phone off, so... <laughs> it's off. So, um, whether the four facts um, uh, tell us um, that Egypt is heading in the right direction uh, or not really. Uh, fact number one, well, that was my cell phone. <laughs> um, 
it's, I mean, it's, it's now high time uh, for phone calls in Egypt. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> After the Friday's prayers. <laughs> and we have, we have uh, demonstrations uh, scheduled for today. Uh, big masses are heading to Tahrir and to Al Abbasiya, where, where we had the violence of the last 48 hours, where 11 people were killed. So back to fact number one, um, the very first fact is that we, we, we are uh, behind in terms of the timetable outlined for handing over power to civilians. Egyptians were promised on February 11, 2011 that the process of handing over power to an elected parliament and an elected president and even having a new constitution will take six months. We are well in, uh, in, 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 we have 17 months behind us, and we only have one elected institution, which is parliament. We are looking forward to the presidential elections, hoping that they will uh, take place on time. The constitution drafting process is going to be delayed, and if the presidential elections will, find, uh, will take place on time, Egypt will have an elected president without a new constitution. So fact number one is that we are facing a great delay in the timetable uh, designed for the handover of power from the military establishment, from SCAF, from the uh, uh, military council to uh, civilian bodies, to elected civilian bodies. And that is definitely um, uh, a development which we have been suffering from in Egypt and continues to be um, one, one of the negative facts when we look at, at the Egyptian transition. It's not only that we are back behind um, in terms of uh, building our institutions, but even the one institution that has been uh, democratically uh, elected, I'm referring to parliament, is facing uh, a great deal of legitimacy deficits for very different reasons. We have a dispute uh, in front of the Supreme Constitutional Court and we might have a ruling. I'm not expecting it, but the possibility is still there. The Supreme Constitutional Court might rule parliament unconstitutional next Sunday. Uh, on May 6, uh, we have legitimacy deficits with regard to the operation between parliament and government, and some of you have been following uh, rising tensions between the government of Prime Minister Ganzuri and uh, parliament. The very fact uh, that we as parliament cannot vote on confidence, cannot have a vote of confidence on government, makes our oversight uh, prerogatives uh, to a great extent obsolete. So. It's, it's not only that we are back behind in terms of electing, building our uh, democratically legitimated institutions, but the one institution we have, parliament, is facing great legitimacy deficits. Um, and you have, you have, you have to, to um, uh, I'm not sure whether you have been seeing uh, pictures, scenes from the Egyptian parliament or not. I mean, we have uh, great difficulties get as MPs getting into parliament and getting out of parliament. We are facing protest activities and uh, groups of uh, protesting people in front of parliament every day. For good reasons, people look at it as a democratically elected institution. They expect much in terms of uh, delivering to basic needs. And when we tell them, well, we are a, a legislative institution, we do not deliver. We are not the executive branch of government. No one, no one uh, listens. So, but anyhow, we have, we have, we have a huge delay in terms of building institutions and legitimacy deficits with regard to the existing institutions. And by the way, the same legitimacy um, uh, crisis was faced by the Constituent Assembly, which was formed and brought down. Uh, two weeks later, which was formed. I was elected to the assembly and I decided to withdraw along with 17 uh, elected members from within parliament and from without. And we decided to withdraw because to our mind, that constituent assembly was not representative of the Egyptian society, politically, socially, uh, male, female representation, and so on and so forth. But that is fact number one. Second fact is Egypt has been facing uh, human rights violations nonstop since February 11, 2011. It's not, and unlike Tunisia, and here we have, we have, we have a real difference between Egypt and Tunisia. It, we continue to face human rights violations since February 11, 2011. And if you were following news uh, two days ago, uh, the day before yesterday, 
uh, in Abbasiyah Square in front of the Defense Ministry, 11 people were killed. And once again, this, the, the very same scenario that we have been encountering in Egypt, the very same setting that we have been encountering in Egypt since February 11, 2011. You have uh, uh, peaceful demonstrators, nonviolent demonstrators. Um, uh, they demonstrate, strike, uh, have a sit-in for a few hours or a few days, and then they get attacked by the so-called armed thugs, as we say in, in, uh, in Egypt. And uh, regardless whether those armed thugs are brought to that place to attack people or whether they are uh, motivated by whatever inclinations they might have to attack them, definitely the security apparatus, security forces, as well as the military establishment, which is in charge, according to the Constitutional Declaration, which is in charge of homeland security as well, are not delivering in terms of securing citizens, in terms of under, uh, getting under control human rights violations. We have been seeing human rights violations in terms of torturing citizens as well. So uh, human rights violations uh, in the streets of Cairo and, and, and other cities, torture. And the big problem of civilians being put for military before military trials, which is yet to stop. In fact, the number of civilians that have been transferred to military trials between February 11, 2011 and today is higher than the number of civilians transferred to military trials in the 30 years of Mubarak uh, rule. So we have to keep that in mind. So the second fact is that we are facing human rights violations torture, civilians being put before military trials. Of course, we are working as parliament legislatively to get rid of that practice of putting uh, civilians before military trials. And so we have introduced the changes already, and they will be uh, effective very soon. But once again, that continues, and it needs to be taken into consideration. Fact number three is um, Egypt has um, developed into a place where politics as a practice, as a daily practice, uh, has become very dynamic and highly diverse and continues to generate attention among citizens. It's not true that Egyptians are frustrated to the extent that they are no longer interested in political affairs. It's completely wrong. It's not the case. Yes, people are concerned with regard to security, concerned with regard to the deteriorating social and economic conditions, but Egyptians continue to be as interested in politics as they were in the 18 days of the revolution. Let me give you two very recent examples. One, the debate, the very vibrant debate we, we had in Egypt about the Constituent Assembly, as it was formed and before it was brought down. And I can tell you from first-hand experiences that people were following the details, uh, regardless of the level of education, regardless of uh, being in urban or in rural areas, because I tour Egypt a great deal, even in, 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 uh, uh, in the last weeks with the par parliamentary mandate. And people were able to outline uh, what they found troubling in the Constituent Assembly in a detailed manner, which I never saw before anywhere else, such a well-informed electorate about what was going on, I mean, the Constituent Assembly, that it's imbalanced politically, imbalanced in terms of gender, imbalanced in terms of Muslim Christian representation, imbalanced in terms of having uh, literally uh, very few experts on constitution affairs, and, and, and. And when you hear that out there in the street, you get a sense of, no, it's, it's not true that Egyptians are fed up with politics and are shifting uh, similar to what we uh, had for a very long time under Mubarak, are only concerned with security, economy, and so on and so forth. A second example is the growing, the growing debate um, right now in Egypt with regard to the presidential elections and whether the timetable will be uh, respected or not. And we have been seeing today, Friday, last Friday, Friday before, in the last three weeks, massive demonstrations across the country uh, with one, one, one slogan, uh, SCAF has to commit to the timetable. SCAF should not mess around with the timetable. The presidential elections should take place uh, on time. And even Islamist and non-Islamist difference with regard to how can we elect a president without having a constitution seem to be sidelined as of now. So those two incidents tell me that, well, Egypt's, Egyptian politics as a sphere, that sphere continues to be very dynamic. Citizens continue to be interested in what's going on. And that is definitely a positive sign while you, we are transitioning transitioning to, uh, to democracy. The fact number four and last fact is, yes, definitely Egyptian politics, our formal political sphere, uh, is structured around an imbalance uh, or lack of balance between Islamist and non-Islamist forces. 
but that imbalance is changing and is being newly defined constantly. And one would be, um, to my mind, not looking at, at what's going on uh, objectively if um, we decide, if we decide to operate based on the pictures that we uh, got out of the parliamentary elections, Islam is winning around 70% or over 70% and everyone else winning around 20% or a bit more, that picture of uh, a missing balance and a, a clear imbalance between Islamists and non-Islamists is changing and changing in, in the political reality in parliament and outside of parliament. Non-Islamists are gradually becoming more relevant, more significant in terms of deciding what's going on in the country politically. The Constituent Assembly was brought down due to a campaign that we launched, due to a non-Islamist campaign. And we were joined in by media, by uh, the administrative court, which uh, put forward the ruling and so on. But it was a well-orchestrated campaign that gave us more than uh, what we are accounted for in terms of the number of seats we have in parliament. Uh, Non-Islamists um, are being increasingly looked at as partners by Islamists, and I can only attest to that in the daily management of parliamentary work. Uh, we are getting out of that minority position into becoming more of an empowered minority, so a weak minority into an empowered minority, and that is changing the dynamics of Egyptian politics in, a, in an interesting manner. To my mind, it's becoming more diverse, it's becoming more pluralist, and uh, we, are, we are gradually building what I would term the rules of the game. Uh, not only to respect the ballot box and the outcome of the ballot box, but to have consensus as an objective as well. The Constituent Assembly was uh, a test case in terms of failing to reach consensus. And the Islamists are learning out of it that they need to have consensus as an objective, that they cannot simply take the country the way they wish or the direction they like and marginalize everyone else. So, so, and that is a very healthy development that is coming relatively quick, to my mind. I mean, after a few months of political dynamics, uh, relatively uh, pluralist and relatively diverse uh, in parliament and outside. So the four facts uh, taken together tell me uh, of course, one, one can add additional facts. Security sector reform completely missing. Addressing uh, the core question with regard to the military establishment and their place in the system. Negotiations are yet to begin, and uh, the bargaining situation which we have to get to uh, is not there yet. Uh, one can add the uh, rule of law, law enforcement, and so on and so forth. Yes, different negative uh, uh, signs, which Egypt continue to sh continues to show. But once again, the four structuring fact of, uh, facts of Egyptian politics tell me that we are well in a process. And I'm not sure whether it's going wrong. I'm not sure, I'm, I, have, I, I continue to be optimistic. Um, I see the dynamics uh, and monitor them, of course, on a daily basis, and am optimistic that it's going to head in the right, uh, in the right direction, but we, we continue to have uh, a couple of years ahead which are, which are extremely tough, and the questions are going to be even more complex. Once again, once we start the constitution drafting process, the question of the military will have to be tackled, and uh, here, immunity, uh, economic holdings, civilian oversight over the military budget, and uh, are they going to have a veto right, yes or no? And so a couple of questions which are very tough to manage. Uh, security sector reform, and when you look into the security sector and see the vested interests, uh, different groups continue to have in not reforming that security sector, and the lack of political will, which we have been facing and suffering from in the last 17 months, whether it will continue or will change with a president-elect or with a civilian president, we'll have to wait and see. But once again, the facts are mixed, uh, but I, 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 I wouldn't push, push the evaluation of the situation as far as to say that Egypt's economic transition is failing. It's, it's far from being, uh, from being a failed process, and we have to wait and see. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you very much, Amr, uh, for this, uh, as you call it, uh, <laughs> uh, messy but, but natural uh, way of doing things, uh, of, of, uh, of transitioning to democracy. Uh, Marina, you've worked with Amr uh, in the past on all of these issues, and Amr has painted uh, a picture where none of the parties seem to be sort of doing well. The secular parties, uh, uh, and you've written about this in the past, have not been able to build constituencies in the past. And has this, uh, in your opinion, view or, or position changed or not? Are they able, as Amr says now, 
to work more uh, 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 in, a, in a transitioning democracy or not? Have the Islamists become more or less moderate uh, as a result of them coming to power? Uh, uh, we've argued in the past that you know inclusion does uh, uh, seem to make them more moderate. Has this been the case in, uh, uh, in Egypt or not? Uh, what about the role of the military? SCAF has <coughs> clearly uh, uh, shifted from being a guarantor of democracy in the beginning to now being a player and a messy player at that, and uh, some, uh, you know, an institution that not many people are happy about from both camps, the secular and the religious camp. So, uh, Marina, how do you see all this, and how would you compare the work that you've done with Amr in the past uh, to the reality today? Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, before I, I start on the substance, I want to, uh, to point out uh, something. When we started the Middle East program, there were three of us, really, who did most of the, at the beginning, who were involved in all this debate. And one person is missing here today is Nathan Brown. I want to point out that we are not boycotting him. He, may, he happens to be in Gaza. We very I saw, much I, wanted I saw him, him to. I saw him yesterday <laughs> and the day before. Okay, <laughs> so, to be part of the conversation. Yes, and I feel, I feel badly that he, is not, that he is not here. I'd like to revisit this point that you uh, brought up about the relevance of the secular parties, the, the non-Islamist, whatever, uh, whatever we want to call them. The problem clearly has not uh, been solved. Because when the election results came out, certainly <clears throat> the first impression was, unfortunately, we were extremely right in our early analysis of the crisis of secular parties, the inability to build constituencies, the fact that while the Islamist parties had worked very diligently, for better or for worse, depending on your point of view, but very diligently at, at organizing, at building constituencies, the, uh, the secular parties did not seem to be able to do, this, uh, to do the same thing, or not necessarily even interested in trying. Some of the reports that have come out in uh, uh, after the election, pointed that there was almost a total absence of presence of the secular parties in some parts of the country. Uh, the data, they were not very present in Upper Egypt, that they were not uh, present in many, uh, in many rural areas, uh, and so on. The evidence I have is scattered, but certainly enough to suggest that this is the case. So the first, uh, uh, certainly from the outside, what it looks is that there is this imbalance that is still there, that has not been corrected. You are now telling us, well, actually, in the actual working of the parliament, uh, there is beginning to, some sort of balance is beginning to be reestablished. The, uh, uh, the, the, the secular element is becoming much more assertive, much more part of the game. But there is still this problem of that if Egypt continues it's going to, uh, on this path, it's going to be an election-based system. And therefore, there is this lack or the, the incapacity of uh, secular parties to build a large constituency is going to remain a handicap. So the question that I really would like to, you know, you are looking at it from the inside. Do you see a real effort to, to remedy that problem? Mm -hmm. What are these parties doing, essentially? What mm -hmm. are these organizations doing? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. Let me let me um, um, refer refer here to two um, uh, recent developments. The first one is the Constitution Party Initiative, put forward by Mohammed Al Baradai, mm -hmm. and looked at uh, by Al Baradai as well by uh, most non-Islamist MPs and politicians as sort of the beginnings of a new umbrella organization, a new big party for non-Islamists, where we will have right, left, and center. The defining uh, identity is going to be non-Islamist, uh, civil, as we say in, e in Egypt. That dichotomy or duality between Islamist parties on the one hand and civil parties on the other hand. El, uh, Baradai's initiative, uh, uh, was announced a few days ago. It's gaining traction. And we had a meeting uh, recently uh, before I came to, uh, to DC. 
and we agreed on a plan. Uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, uh, free to disclose what we agreed on, but it's a plan of merging uh, different small liberal and left of center uh, parties in one big umbrella party where al uh, Baradai as well as um, uh, other MPs or politicians uh, who have come to be trusted uh, by significant uh, numbers of Egyptians will come together in one umbrella organization. And the driving logic is definitely to, to do better in terms of constituency uh, uh, building activities and outreach activities, which is a big deficit that liberal and leftist parties continue to have, or secular parties continue to have. Um, secondly, uh, parliament, and what, so what I was trying to refer to is that we finally, I mean, we are finally having a space where we can interact uh, under real conditions, where it's not about parties sitting together in rooms, agreeing on merging or not merging. No, we needed that test of the ballot box. And I have been saying it before the elections and after the elections. We were asked several times as liberal candidates, why don't you join forces? Why do you have so much in terms of binary competition? I mean, in the district where I ran, I had uh, 84 uh, competitors. Uh, on, on that one independent seat. And most of them, most of them were can, candidates from El Wavd or from the Free Egyptians, or I mean, only the Egyptian Social Democratic Party, because of friendship, decided not to nominate a candidate. In the <laughs> but at any rate, so it, wa it, wa it was a highly competitive uh, race. And the same happened everywhere else. And so we were pushed, why don't you merge? Why don't you coordinate? And I, I, I used to say, well, we need the ballot box. We need to know where every one of us stands, be it as a party or as an independent politician. And then we have we need the reality of parliamentary cooperation, of parliamentary work, legislative and oversight work, to know how we can build an agenda, how we can build a joint platform. And that is happening, and I'm confident it's going to go in the right direction. So it's, it's, it's answer number one to that deficit which we continue to have. Secondly, and here I'm leaving secular parties or liberal and leftist parties aside and looking more at, at, at the question, are Islamists going to continue to benefit? from their constituency building and outreach activities the same way they have been benefiting from that in the last parliamentary elections, I doubt that very much. Now, you have to monitor what people are saying in Egypt and how public opinion trends are shifting. People would tell you, well, we went and voted for them, and they are not delivering. I mean, people see the great difference between how we perform I mean, that small group, I mean, if you see the uh, live broadcast from the assembly, you would know that liberal MPs sit in four rows. I mean, we are, we are a small group, tiny group of 27, exactly. <laughs> and we have four rows, and each one of us has now his, his or her, I mean, her is only one, uh, <laughs> uh, spot. In, but, but people refer to us as a good per performing block. But we, we have been very active in terms of pushing forward legislation. Before I came to DC, I managed in the committee, one of the committees, I'm serving on two committees, one on human rights and one on constitution and legal affairs, and we managed to finalize uh, the draft of a new law for NGOs to get finally rid of that <laughs> troubling issue of NGOs and foreign funding, and uh, it's, it's done. And it, it, we, I, I led that effort with Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat, who is the head of, uh, of the committee, and we, we were engaged in a consensus building process where Islamists, freedom and justice, as well as Salafi Noor, were part of the process and agreed on a draft which is, which is, in terms of the credentials, in terms of the outlook, a real liberal law. And it's going to present a great push forward with regard to Egyptian civil society and cooperation with foreign organizations. We have been very active in terms of introducing changes on torture um, to tighten up punishments with regard to sexual harassment. And so we are blocking, I am blocking single-handedly, blocking an education reform, and we'll have a new debate in, in the assembly next week. We have been very active, and people realize that. So what I hear is, yes, they have been working with us, offering social services, but we are not so sure that that is what we need in parliament, that those are the MPs whom we need in parliament. So that shift is taking place too. And it's going to, to, to be, to my mind, quite effective in terms of pushing some people at least to reconsider whether they should vote for Islamists or not. And the first test is going to be the presidential elections. And I'm not so sure whether Islamist candidates, especially party Islamist candidates, are going to do as well as Islamist candidates in the, in the parliamentary elections did. 
in, in, in November and December uh, la uh, last year. So it's a mixed picture. But once again, we are, we, those are real dynamics. I mean, what I am happy about when I compare to the research which we did, well, back then, secular parties were locked up. I mean, they could not interact. They could not oper operate in a political reality, even as messy as that reality may be. But now we have, we have, we have those real dynamics, and it's turning out to, to mean changes, shifts, reconsideration, and so on and so forth. I mean, all what parties have to do to be real parties. Amr, you, you touched upon, I think, two uh, uh, areas that uh, a lot of people have questions about and areas that will have a, a big say on the future of democracy on Egypt, in Egypt. And I would like you to elaborate on, 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 two, on these two. The first is the Islamist parties and their support. A lot of people, well, some people, and I, I, I see that you uh, may be one of them, are saying that we have indeed seen the peak of support for the Islamists. And that once they get in the system and have to deliver, then they will be just like everybody else. Uh, uh, they will have their successes and failures, but other people, as they develop their organizational skills, will be able to compete in the next elections. First, I would like you to elaborate on this and to answer the question that uh, people have, which is, uh, will there be next elections, and will the Islamists uh, allow these elections to happen? And if they uh, don't allow it, will Egyptian society, you know, accept that or not? So it's a question that everybody, sure. everybody has. The the other question that uh, you uh, touched upon, and I'd like you to elaborate on, is this: I guess what is referred in this country as a bill of rights. Right. In other words, you know, you you write a constitution. Is it going to be? done through a consensus process? Will people agree on sort of the general principles, pluralism at all times, individual rights, uh, peaceful means, you know, right. these, uh, or will, will uh, that not be the case and a right. constitution will be written uh, through a majority-led process that would not take into account the rights of the minorities or, or personal rights? Can you elaborate sure. on these two issues? Sure. Because I think these are sort of key to people's uh, uh, anxiety about them. Sure. Yeah, can I piggyback? The, because it's a related issue, essentially. In the past discussions, we speculated a lot of whether participation in a normal political process, assuming the process in Egypt is normal now, which is kind of borderline, uh, the question was, would it moderate, lead Islamists to moderate their position, or would it have the opposite effect? And I think the the signals that we are getting, and this is related to uh, Marwan's question about whether they will allow second election and so on, it's very mixed because you get uh, statements, uh, some statements that really do indicate a great deal of pragmatism. And other statements by other people in the organization, or whether it's deliberate or not, that seem to you know, occasionally give you pause for thought and say, these parties are really going in a very fundamentalist direction. So the, if you can sure. you know, elaborate on that as sure. well. Sure. OK, well, uh, to Islamists, I mean, we, we, uh, we have to keep in mind that we are looking at a spectrum that is by no means homogeneous. And if that statement was true, as we were doing our research back in 2006, 7, and 8, it's even more true as of now. Because even, even if you take representation in parliament as an indicator, I mean, we have two big blocks. Uh, we have freedom and justice, the political arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, and we have the Salafi Noor party, which did extremely well. Uh, in the elections. I mean, for a party to be formed a few months before the elections, to contest elections for the first time in its very short life, and to win over 20% uh, of the seats, that was an impressive showing. And um, to my mind, when you compare the organizational apparatus of a Noor and their constituency, of the Salafi Noor party and their constituency uh, and outreach activities, they are by no means uh, um, um, we, we are by no means looking at an apparatus of less capabilities as compared to the Muslim Brotherhood. It's, it's a very impressive apparatus which they managed mm -hmm. to build in, in, a, in a very short time. But now, Islamists, and um, here two questions. One, which Mar Marwan, which you raised about support for Islamists. I mean, have we seen the peak of it? Uh, I, 
are they, are they going to be looked at as participants in the political process and will be judged based on the merits of what they do? Uh, I believe that that is exactly the shift that is taking place in Egypt while people are monitoring uh, performance in parliament and are evaluating what parliament can do and cannot do and who is pushing what and uh, who is getting what out of parliament. So in a way, um, and which, which is why we are looking at, a, at an environment that is much, much better than the envir environment we had before the parliamentary elections. Before the parliamentary elections, it was about statements. And so everyone was stating uh, where the respective party stands on different key issues, constitution, democratic transition, rule of law, and so on and so forth. And so what really mattered in terms of uh, mo motivating, mobilizing <coughs> Egyptians to go uh, and vote. And what really mattered in terms of voter preferences was what people knew about different political actors or personalities before. And definitely political parties which were able and have been using religion as an asset for a long time were able to mobilize and uh, uh, bigger numbers uh, of Egyptians and get them to vote and get them to wait for the long hours people uh, had to wait in front of the ballot box. Now we are inserting or a new factor is being uh, injected into that political calculation which citizens do when they look at political parties, which is a performance factor. Performance from a legislative perspective, performance from an oversight perspective, and performance in terms, e in terms of um, uh, um, uh, compatibility of what you say with what you do. And there is a real gap between what Islamists have been promising people and what they are delivering uh, in parliament. So that performance factor is changing the picture. And I tend to believe that, yes, we have seen the peak of it, and it's going to change. And they are going to be treated and dealt with as political actors, will be judged and evaluated based on the merits of what they do, not based on their excessive use of religion or excessive social service delivery machines um, that once again, Egyptians are coming to realize, well, is that really what we need in parliament? I mean, we are, at, at the end of the day, which, and that analogy I heard several times. I mean, we went and elected parliamentarians, and we got uh, mayors and uh, officials in local municipalities. So people are, are realizing the difference between what you need at the national level to deliver legislatively in terms of oversight, and when you elect an MP, who turns out to be simply a local official, I mean, offering you some help with regard to the day-to-day -day management of your life. So yes, we have seen the peak of it, and it's changing. And liberal forces are doing a better job in terms of outlining and highlighting the deficits of Islamist performance. And so the Constituent Assembly was a test case. I mean, and we did very well. I mean, and by the way, the position taken by liberal forces regarding the Constituent Assembly was the first unified position we took, all of us, since February 11, 2011. It was the first time that we managed to stage a campaign, have a unified position, stage a campaign, and we were successful in bringing it, uh, in bringing it down. Um, second point on Islam is, so yes, we have seen the peak of it, and it's, it's, uh, it's bound to change, but we need to do more in order to get uh, to be more in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better competing position. Secondly, are they moderating? Once again, here's the diversity of the spectrum really needs to be taken extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. And I would not, I would not generalize. Um, I, I, I believe that we have to differ differentiate between freedom and justice, uh, the political arm of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has been going through uh, debates and discussions uh, about commitment to ideology and uh, pragmatism throughout the last decades. I mean, they have been participating in the autocratic politics of Egypt since uh, late 70s. Uh, and in a way, um, they are mature in terms of how they treat uh, uh, and how they define their positions uh, in that continuum uh, with the two poles, pragmatism and commitment to Islamist ideology. And so they are, I guess they are, they are going well. I, however, and here, uh, unlike what we uh, wrote before, I wouldn't term what's going on as a process of moderation. It's much more complex than that. When you look at the reality of it, one has really to outline, it has to be taken as a case, based on a case-by-case -case approach. So we do not have a sweeping moderation process or a sweeping lack of moderation, no. It has to be looked at based on very concrete cases, the sectors, the spheres which we are looking at. Islamists are becoming more moderate in terms of, or more pragmatic in terms of uh, uh, the constitution when it comes to political rights and human rights. But they 
are forced, especially with the existence of the Noor Salafi party, of the Salafi bloc, to take more of conservative positions on personal freedoms and personal rights. So we are not looking at a sweeping process uh, which whose end is moderation, no. It has to be looked at based on the sectors, the mm -hmm. spheres, uh, and the questions, the defining questions. And you will see a very mixed process. And by the way, and, I'm, and I hope Carnegie is working on that, I, I've been reading uh, recent, I mean, of course, interest in what will happen in Egypt. I've been reading uh, some recent research pieces about AK Party in Turkey. And it seems that the same um, uh, assumption that they are moderating or have been moderating over time is not very accurate. That once again, I mean, you, you really have to, to differentiate between the different spheres of operation in politics. I mean, AK Party, clearly, at least some segments in AK Party has that um, uh, drive toward hegemony and control. And they are tightening up their positions and their uh, platform in terms of getting to be more conservative on different issues. In fact, the recommendation, uh, and I'm, I'm sure of the inf inf piece of information which I'm going to share, uh, uh, the, in the recommendation to freedom and justice to run a candidate in the presidential elections was delivered to freedom and justice, to a freedom and justice delegation in Turkey, in Istanbul, and from AK Party. And the argument was, if you can take it all, take it all. If you can contest all available seats in the executive branch as well as, as, well as in the legislative branch, do not wait. Do it now. So, but at any rate, I mean, the question of moderation needs to be outlined differently with regard to freedom and justice. Mm -hmm. With regard to al Noor, you will be surprised that it's, it's, it is as mixed a picture as it is with regard to freedom and justice, but differently. al Noor, of course, uh, as a party, has a very conservative platform on personal freedoms, personal rights, and uh, uh, we have interesting debates. I, 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 I hope someone will work on them. I mean, I um, uh, have been part of a debate on... Um, uh, as I said, I mean, I have introduced a, uh, um, uh, an amendment, a set of amendments to Egyptian laws regarding sexual harassment and sexual crimes against women and children. And the Noor party blocked it. And they have been blocking it since then. And they have highly conservative, a highly conservative outlook when it comes to personal freedoms. Um, they are trying to bring down the age of marriage from 16 and some Egyptian laws and 18 and other Egyptian laws, it's, it's not unified, by the way, to 14 or even less. So you, you have a clearly conservative uh, platform when it comes to personal freedoms, but when you cooperate with them on political rights or on freedom of association or freedom of organization, they are completely for it and with no reservations whatsoever. In fact, they were our partners in pushing forward the liberal bill for NGOs and they managed to contain reservations on freedom and justice side. So the dynamics are very interesting. So once again, I mean, of course, I do not have uh, the time to sit down and uh, write, but I, I, I would love for someone to keep an eye on what's going on in terms of uh, debates in parliament and how different bills are being debated and who is pushing what and what the consensus outcome uh, is always be. Second question of Marwan is, is, is key to what's going on in Egypt, and I'm going to be brief, but it's, it's a highly significant question. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Consensus based, or is it going to be the outcome of uh, a majoritarian uh, um, uh, a majoritarian definition of what Constitution should, uh, should be about? I believe that we, uh, uh, we are yet to see uh, the real interaction and the real uh, uh, back and forth with regard to the Constitution. And I believe that we have, uh, as non-Islamists or liberals or secular forces, we have managed to mobilize wide segments of the Egyptian electorate uh, to make it alert and to make it in favor, clearly in favor of having a Constitution that is not based on a major majoritarian uh, principle. It, yes, the minority needs to be taken into consideration. Yes, the civil nature of the Egyptian state needs to be protected. Granting equal citizenship rights uh, to all Egyptians is key. Uh, having a uh, rule of law uh, without any discrimination against non-Muslims or against women is key as well. And so we have managed in the last 17 months, including in the build-up towards the parliamentary elections, to get wide segments of the Egyptian population alert and interested in pushing for that. And that was the reason why they were on our side, bringing down the Constituent Assembly. So it's yet to happen, Marwan. It will start soon. 
uh, we will have to wait and see. I am confident that with that popular support, we will get it uh, to go in the right direction. And that Islamists have learned their lesson from the constituent assembly that if they overplay their hands, it turns against them. It turns against them in a, in a, in a way which they do not like to see happening again. Uh, and I am certain that what happened in the last few months will impact negatively on the prospects of freedom of freedom and justice candidate in the presidential elections. But we'll have to wait and see. So uh, we stand in, 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 uh, in a very firm and clear manner for a consensus-based uh, process to write the Constitution and a consensus-based outcome. So it's not only about the text. It's about the process itself. I mean, I'm not going to be part of a constituent assembly unless we have enough rep decent representation of women, decent representation of non-Muslims. I outlined my reasons for getting out. So I, am, I cannot be part of that constituent assembly having such a terrible representation uh, of women and non-Muslims. I do not like to be part of, a, of an assembly where we do not have human rights defenders and experts on constitution issues and so on and so forth. And the same is going to be said time and again if they overplay their hand one more time. There are lots of questions from the audience. I, I'd like just both of you maybe to be very brief about trying to compare Egypt and Tunisia. Why is Egypt uh, struggling so much as compared to Tunisia in both your views? Why is Tunisia having a seemingly a smoother transition process than is the case uh, with Egypt? Should I uh, get started uh, on that or Marina? Yeah, Marina, please. Who, who OK, okay. L l let me start. And I'll start to, to some extent contradicting Marwan's question, <laughs> because uh, if you look at Tunisia is getting very good press in this country. This is the successful transition as compared to the mess Egypt is in. And certainly superficial, this is true. Egypt, uh, Tunisia had a smoother process. They, could, they agreed earlier on about what the process itself was going to be, so that they, and they followed it, while Egypt keeps on changing, trying to change the rules of the game, even now about what are the steps, how you form the constituent assembly, and so on. So in that sense, Tunisia did it much better. But if you start looking more deeply at what is going on in Tunisia, you see the same issues at play that we see that we see in Egypt. There is the same tension between Islamists and non-Islamists. There are the same tension in Nakda between the various currents that Tamra was talking about in terms of the Islamic spectrum. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, there, there are the same really deep suspicions uh, that uh, the two sides uh, ha harbor against each other. Uh, you talk to Nakda people, more, the, or more broadly people in the Islamist sector, and they talk about uh, the secularists as if they were all Stalinists. I mean, you really get this, uh, you know, these are all the old, uh, the sort of the French left and, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the atheist and so on. There is this real, and a lot of concern about them. And then you talk to the other side, you talk to the, the secular element, and they tell you the same thing. You don't, uh, you know, don't believe anything that Nakda says. Don't believe anything they say because they say one thing to, uh, to you and they say something totally different to their constituents so that you cannot, and they are ready to believe. I mean, both sides are ready to believe the worst that, uh, about uh, the other side. So what I would argue is that Tunisia is still in for a lot of trouble. I think that this idea that somehow that is smooth transition really is, uh, uh, is not quite correct. I, I, uh, I completely agree, uh, not only for nationalistic reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I, I feel touched. I mean, no one knows that. Once Egypt is compared to any other country, I still respond that I'm very nationalistic. I made it very, I served it to you on this in the I'm glad that Marwan did not mention Jordan. I would have been even more harsh on him than what I'm going to be now. <laughs> No, I mean it's it's. I'm 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 I'm, I'm I've been following to an extent uh, developments in Tunisia, and I I completely agree with uh, what Marina outlined. I mean, they are facing uh, the same troubles. Uh, it is the same messy transition, but in a different way. Um, Egypt, uh, as compared to Tunisia, has been suffering from two additional deficits which uh, Tunisians have been able to uh, get rid of with the departure of Ben Ali. 
uh, number one, human rights violations. And that is a, a difference that needs to be taken into consideration. We have been facing human rights violations that are by no means different from what happened under Mubarak. Uh, and that does not exist in Tunisia. Uh, secondly, Tunisians, I mean, political forces managed to get an agreement, a workable agreement on the roadmap, on the way ahead. And that has been contested time and again and continues to be contested in Egypt on a daily basis. We do not have an agreement on the roadmap. It's a step forward, a step backward, uh, constitution first, elections first, I mean, all of the debates which have been following. So those are the two differences, I mean, objectively, between the two countries. But otherwise, no. I mean, what we are witnessing and, and, and experiencing in Egypt is being experienced in Tunisia as well, including uh, tensions uh, between uh, militant Islamists and uh, moderate, uh, so-called moderate Islamists and non-Islamists. And uh, I mean, at least at least Egypt did not see uh, a Salafi flag uh, being uh, hissed <laughs> at a university campus yet. So um, no, it's it's uh, it's the same messy transition. But I, I believe that what we are going through in Egypt is as real as what is happening in Tunisia. And those processes are bound to be messy. I, I, we did not expect them to be any different. So we have to be a bit patient. And if, if the electorate is patient, I mean, if Egyptians haven't given up yet, and I'm very grateful for that, on the potential for democratic transition, for rule of law, I mean, why should, we be, why should we be so quick in terms of describing the transition as a failed transition? It's not. It's not. All right, let's open it up. Please. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I will Thank try you. to get as many as possible. It's Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, Amr, and congratulations on your marriage, too. Thank you, Munz. <laughs> uh, you alluded to outside interference indirectly. You didn't uh, elaborate on Turkey when they gave advice or order to the party to uh, take everything. Uh, but how about the regional forces interference in Egypt? Namely, uh, we talk about the money, <clears throat> political money from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from the Gulf states, from others probably, and probably from Turkey by other means and other uh, outside forces how they are affecting this period in Egypt. Uh, also, you alluded a little bit about the presidential, I'm not talking about American presidential election, the Egyptian. What is your take on that uh, competition? And can you give us, I know you cannot predict, but at least right. give us some sense of who you think it's going to happen. Uh, one last comment, just, yeah. We have so many questions, please. I, yeah. I will have to cut you short because a lot of people want to ask okay. questions. Thank you. I will take Thank you. It. Robert. Um. Uh, I actually wanted to follow up on that uh, and ask how the election of Amr Musa, for example, or Abu Fatou might affect the constitutional debate in terms of the balance. Do, you, do they push for a presidential system, a parliamentary system, um, and how the dynamics might play out whoever becomes president? Thank you for Oh. Ma, you can identify uh, yourself. Okay, I'm Ibrahim Hussein. I live here in Washington, D.C. I am. Uh, I have a question. I'm really delighted what Amr said, that there is more collaboration, which there is a word, there is no Arabic word for it, between the central and the liberal and progressive forces, which is wonderful. I'm delighted to hear that. Now, my question is, what does your group or the, the, the secular group think of Al-Azhar document? Could this be a flag or a, <coughs> adopted by your new group as a way to attract more simple-minded Muslims to join your organization, which is, I believe is an excellent document? Thank you. Let's stop here. I think three very uh, right. <laughs> heavy questions. Okay, let me let me start with uh, Munzer's uh, questions on on, uh, and it's of course a pleasure to see you on foreign interference. Um, well, I mean you're, you're right. I mean we have uh, we have uh, regional as well as international uh, powers uh, trying their hands in reaching out in different ways uh, to Egyptian political actors. Uh, we have. 
different uh, rumors slash allegations slash confirmed information about funding to uh, different political actors, political parties coming from the Gulf or coming from elsewhere. And in, in a way, uh, with regard to foreign uh, interference, Egypt is in a, in a phase, to my mind, that never uh, occurred before, where we have a plurality of foreign actors trying to interfere and influence domestic politics. I mean, back under Mubarak, I mean, the uh, line of uh, interference and of attempting to influence Egyptian politics always went to the presidential palace. Right now, we have too many addresses, but one address is emerging to be a dominant one. And of course, if you monitor congressional trips uh, or trips by uh, delegations of the State Department, and I made sure to mention that uh, I mean, out loud in my meetings yesterday and the day before, I mean, the guidance office of the Muslim Brotherhood seems to be the replacement in some people's minds for the presidential palace. So, and I was, I mean, I was asked to give a very concrete example. I, mean, I was asked to uh, attend a meeting with Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman. And so I, I asked, OK, when? They said, so they gave me, the embassy gave me an idea of the schedule. And point one in the schedule was a, was a visit to the guidance office. And so I was not very happy about that. And then second, I asked, OK, so when, where are we going to meet them? They said, well, you are invited to come to a hotel. I said, no, I'm not coming to see a senator, and I'm an MP in a hotel. He should come to parliament and meet me. I have an office. And so in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure with regard to foreign powers, which addresses they have in I mean, the map of cent powers, um, center of powers in Egypt, how it looks like. As well. I have the feeling that increasingly the guidance office is being put in the same place the presidential palace used to be. And uh, regional actors as well as international actors are primarily reaching out to the Muslim Brotherhood or wider to Islamists and are ignoring everyone else. And in doing so, they are missing a great part of the reality of Egyptian uh, politics. And in doing so, um, um, I, I believe that they are pushing Islamists once and again, time and again, to overplay their hands. because. Big parties, if they feel that they are the only ones taken seriously internationally, tend to look at partners domestically in a different way. So they tend to isolate and marginalize you. So my, my recommendation would be, we, I mean, we will continue to suffer from that foreign interference for some time uh, and continue to suffer from it, not because I dislike it, no, but because it's, it's, it's messy as well. It's as messy as the process is. Uh, uh, money coming in and no one knows uh, from where. Exactly, and there is no transparency. And part of the troubles which we had in Egypt was about lack of transparency, even with regard to the operation of American and European organizations. I mean, to be honest, I mean, if we take it very seriously. So that lack of transparency is troubling, and that one address which is emerging as the new sort of uh, quasi-presidential or temporary presidential palace until we have an elected president is too dangerous. Secondly, on, on the presidential elections, I'm not, I'm, I, I can, I'm, I'm not in a position to speculate on uh, prospects um, uh, in order not to be misunderstood. And I myself, I'm going to stay neutral as an elected MP. I mean, at the end of the day, I am a member in uh, a legislative body which is supposed to uh, practice oversight vis-a-vis -vis the elected president. So I, I'm not going to endorse anyone, and I am not going to offer my analysis. And I do have an analysis, but I cannot offer it in order not to be misunderstood. So and, 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 order, and here I have to respect my role uh, as a parliamentarian. Now, the question on whether the new president will have uh, some influence on the constitution writing process is an interesting question. And yes, definitely. Uh, the new president will have an, 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 uh, some influence on the constitution writing process. The new president, regardless of uh, his identity, is bound to be part of, uh, of the de deliberations. Uh, probably the constituent assembly will be formed before, the new constituent assembly will be formed before we have an elected president. But the deliberations within the assembly with regard to different constitutional articles, with regard to the new constitution, will be influenced by the president. We have two groups of candidates here. One group where we should expect a push for a presidential system, and uh, a couple of candidates where we should expect a push for a parliamentary system. And the divide is very much non-Islamist-Islamist. Non-Islamist presidential, Islamist uh, parliamentary. 
That is all what I can say on the presidential elections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Yes, please. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, sorry. No, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Ibrahim's question. Um, well, the Azhar uh, document, the Azhar document documents, the Azhar uh, has put forward two excellent documents, one on uh, democracy and the future of Egypt, and one on uh, personal freedoms, sort of a bill of rights, but it's, it's, it's a generic text, so it's not written in, in a legal language. Uh, the two documents were adopted by all secular uh, and liberal parties. And the moment Al-Azhar issued its documents, the next day we had a conference, we adopted it, uh, we used it in our election campaigns, and we continue to coordinate with Al-Azhar very, very well. The Grand Imam, Dr. Ahmad Al-Tayyib, was a great help uh, in, in, in the struggle to bring down the Constituent Assembly. And once Al-Azhar decided to pull out its two representatives, the Constituent Assembly was doomed. And without Al-Azhar doing it, I'm not sure whether we, we would have reached the same uh, result or not. So we are coordinating and cooperating very, very well with Al-Azhar. And we continue to use the documents. And we continue to use them in terms of reaching out to moderate elements in Islamist parties. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not only, I mean, I do not like to, to paint a picture whereby secular uh, forces will, will only cooperate among themselves. No. I mean, we are obliged. I mean, it is necessary that we reach out to Islamists as well. And if you look at, at the realities of parliament, I mean, uh, we have been able to build relationships of trust with Islamists in the last three months. And uh, some pieces of legislation are being pushed forward due to that trust and due to the consensus building process all of us are part of. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm by no means arguing for um, sort of um, uh, uh, a linear uh, understanding whereby secular forces or liberal forces should ignore Islamists and cooperate among themselves. No, that would not do. But, but can you comment, Amr, on the Freedom and Justice Party and the North Party's reaction to the Azhar document. Well, they, they adopted, they they, adopted, they adopted the two documents so. as well. No, it's, it, I mean, whatever Al-Azhar put, puts forward, uh, especially with the, I mean, with the status Dr. Ahmad Al-Tayyib has and the intellectual credentials he brings in, uh, will be adopted by political forces. And um, he, he tried his hand, in fact, in uh, minimizing differences between Islamists and liberal forces before the elections, called for different com conferences and meetings. I was part of those meetings. And he, Al-Azhar, as an establishment, is, is playing a very good role. Over there. Daniel Moro, Johns Hopkins CTR. Uh, can you assess, please, the situation of the Christian in Egypt, and uh, how the Egyptian-Israeli relation could impact on this trend. Thank you. Hamad Shina, Voice of America. Dr. Amr, if a president is elected without a constitution in place, what would define his authorities? OK, let's get something to that. No women. Um, I'm Sahar Mahmoud Taman, and I'm here actually as your constituent because I am from your district, Masjid I was born there, but I've lived here for a long time. Um, I wanted first to ask you to comment on your popularity and celebrity among Egyptian women, and how <laughs> and how much uh, you no, know, there was a lot of uh, people pining. Man now. Yes, <laughs> pining uh, when you. My were wife is in town. <laughs> and how much that may have had to do with your winning in the first round. But uh, seriously, um, I'm a little bit uh, um, taken off guard when you refer to you non-Islamist and refer to yourself as non-Islamist or even the word secular. I know it's in English, but uh, you know, referring to the non is, is very um, disconcerting. Sure. Also, a reference to non-Muslims is, is also disconcerting to coming from, um, from you. Um, but my, my real question is, again, about the dynamics of the parliament, and I'm very interested in how that works, and specifically among what I would like to see um, with the women. I understand there are nine women. Is there some kind of a pragmatic effort among the women 
not to, cre to kind of create some kind of a women's caucus. What, what I hear uh, from women is that, oh, most of those women who were part of the political Islamists are anti-women themselves, that they are there as tokens, they're props of their party, and they're alienating them, and therefore those are you know, useless seats. Is there some kind of dynamics, not just among women, but somebody to sort of create a real block? I mean, there's a lot of merit that women have. So that's my real sure. question. Okay, let me, let me start with my uh, constituents' uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, your remark on the nun uh, in, in, in non-Islamists and non-Muslims is well taken. Let me explain where, uh, where that language comes from. Uh, on Islamists and non-Islamists, I mean, we have been using that in academic uh, writings and research writings for a very simple reason, that it's very difficult to pinpoint the platform of parties and actors that cannot be identified as Islamists. It's quite a diverse spectrum. Left and right, right of center, left of center. Some of them are for a strong state, some less. Some of them are concerned with uh, democracy, and some are concerned with market economy. So that, that uh, definition by negation, which is implied in non-Islamists, is related to the diversity of ideas and platforms which we have in that camp. But that camp is, I mean, growingly, increasingly coming together. And I believe that we will have, I mean, we have elements, beginning elements of a liberal discourse uh, on uh, society and politics in Egypt. We did not have those elements as we were approaching the elections. Some of us did. I mean, I, I ran based on a platform which I identified as a liberal platform, clearly. I mean, that was the language which I used, and I never pulled back from using that language in spite of huge attacks by uh, Islamists, some conservative elements uh, in the press. Uh, but the elements of a, lib a truly liberal discourse on the economy, on society, on uh, women's rights, on um, uh, uh, on democratic transition, on politics, are emerging. And we are coming close to, ident I guess, we can now, with, with real merits, identify our movement, the different in independent MPs and small parties, as representing a liberal camp. So that none, I hope, will disappear soon. But it has there is an objective uh, background. On non-Muslims, and let me let me tell you why, why I used it here, because I, I mean, the moment I refer to Muslims and Christians in Egypt, I am marginalizing the existence of others, and they do exist in our society. I mean, people tend to ignore the fact that we continue to have Egyptian Jews, that we have Baha'is in Egypt. And so I am very conscious in terms of using that language in order not to bring it down to a duality, uh, which is, of course, uh, the reality to a great extent. I mean, we're talking about 98%, maybe, or 99% of our society, but we still have others uh, whose existence need, needs to be recognized. And it's not, and we, are, we, are, we have been doing a very poor job in terms of recognizing the existence of others in Egypt. And so at least the language which I'm using, I'm trying to make it as sensitive as possible, which is why even in my Arabic writings, I continue to refer to female citizens with male citizens, uh, which however does not explain the popularity you were referring to. Uh, now, uh, on, um, on 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 uh, parliaments uh, and whether I mean in the Egyptian parliament in the assembly uh, whether women female MPs are coming together to work in a focused manner on uh, relevant issues no it's not happening it's not happening because as you as you uh, I mean regardless of the evaluation but once again here we have two blocks we have uh, four female MPs. Uh, who represent uh, freedom and justice. In fact, in terms of female representation, uh, it is the highest representation in any party bloc. I mean, they have four. el Wabd has only two. Uh, the Egyptian Democratic Party has only one female MP. Um, we have a total of 11 female MPs in an assembly of 508, nine elected and two appointed. Two were appointed uh, uh, by SCAF, the 10 appointees. Uh, now, that platform is not emerging, but I believe that uh, women's issues and rights will be debated uh, extensively starting uh, September, October 2012. 
I mean, we see the beginnings now. I mean, that uh, draft legislation to bring down the age of marriage, uh, a different draft legislation on custody, which is, uh, I mean, we have, to my mind, the right laws in place. Uh, I mean, laws granting women the right to divorce and granting women uh, custody, and there are attempts to change that. And there are attempts to describe those, those laws as simply the outcome of aut autocratic Egypt, uh, of what uh, former president's uh, uh, wife used to do and what she pushed forward, and Egypt needs to be freed from those autocratic elements. And that would uh, be extremely dangerous in terms of uh, women's rights. So, but we, we, we will have those conflicts emerging, and only then we'll be able to, to judge whether we have uh, a group of female parliamentarians and male parliamentarians coming together to defend women's rights or not. Uh, but we are conscious. I'm reflecting on the 27 MPs whom I refer to. We are conscious, con very conscious about what's going on and are well prepared to argue against the changes uh, that some Islamist elements will try to push, uh, push forward. On, uh, on uh, Muhammad's question, yes, I'm the, probably we will have a, an elected president and uh, his mandate. Uh, and we, we only have male candidates. So his mandate is legitimate. We only have male candidates, 13 male candidates. Uh, his mandate will not be clearly defined. So what we will have is an extension of the same mandate which SCAF had. I mean, SCAF ruled Egypt starting February 11, 2011, or uh, in March 30th with a, uh, Declare, was a constitutional declaration based on a set of uh, presidential authorities and prerogatives, which are very wide, uh, huge. We will continue to have a president ruling uh, and practicing his mandate based on those uh, authorities and prerogatives until we have the new constitution and until we clarify the question whether Egypt will go in a parliamentary or in a presidential uh, direction. Am I afraid of that? Yes, it's not an ideal situation, but we managed to uh, in a way to, to, to endure SCAF. And uh, with that set of authorities and prerogatives, I believe that an elected president who is going to be accountable uh, before the people will be easier to manage, as opposed to SCAF. Uh, finally, Arab-Israeli Arab issues and Egyptian Christians. Once again, I mean, on, 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 on Egyptian Christians, um, uh, there are contradictory um, uh, signs which, which need to be taken uh, note of. Uh, we have uh, growing numbers uh, of Egyptian Christians leaving the country, but we have growing numbers of Egyptian Christians joining parties and becoming politically active. So it's, it, uh, I mean, Egypt's political dynamism is by no means uh, Muslim majority dominated dynamism. That is very, very wrong. I mean, we have great, uh, uh, participation by Egyptian Christians, and um, uh, so we, we do have those contradictory signals uh, coming out of the Christian community. And there are huge issues at stake, equal citizenship rights, the new constitution, the legislative framework, are we going to see changes which would be seen as uh, irritating or threatening for the Christian community? Uh, remains to be seen. Uh, I, am, I am as un unsatisfied with Christian representation, Coptic representation in parliament, as I am unsatisfied with regard to female representation. We only have a very few uh, Coptic MPs in, in parliament. Uh, but once again, I mean, the questions are raised, discussed, and I'm, 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 uh, I continue to be uh, satisfied, not um, uh, extremely worried about the Christian community in Egypt as long as they participate in Egyptian politics and in uh, public debates and as long as they continue to monitor the situation. Uh, e uh, Egyptian-Israeli relations, well, of course, I mean, you, you, you've taken notice of uh, the gas, natural gas uh, agreement, which uh, was brought to an end to, uh, and was seen as a uh, uh, right step, as a step in the right direction. And uh, I have to say that the Egyptian-Israeli relations, and I'm here reflecting on a very wide national consensus, the priority is to keep it as it is and keep it, I mean, keep, sustain the peace treaty and do not do more. 
as long as uh, Israeli actions uh, in the West Bank uh, continue, as long as uh, the Palestinian uh, situation continues to deteriorate, settlement activities continue to be on the rise, I, we, we do not have an interest in uh, moving the Egyptian-Israeli relations beyond the existing crisis. So in a way, it's a minimalist approach, and I feel it is legitimate. And I was, I mean, to be very honest, I was completely for stopping uh, and ending the natural gas uh, agreement. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not happy to, uh, to see Egypt delivering gas, natural gas, to Israel while Israel continues its uh, settlement activities and while the Palestinian issue continues to be unresolved. So uh, it's not a priority. Uh, we will sustain the peace treaty, full stop. Yes, <laughs> gentlemen of the house. Thank you very much. Glad to see you. My name is Yaya Fanusi. I am the lead person for the United States of Africa 2017 project. I am the lead person for the Special Operations Division. By September next year, there will be a network of all African political parties of all spectrum which we're setting up inside Africa and also outside Africa, and hopefully the Egyptian parties. We're also launching a civic education campaign throughout Africa. So you want to keep that win. After you guys finish your election and all that type of thing, we'll contact you. <laughs> yes, the woman in the back. Oh, yes. He comes to all our meetings. Um, the question is for Mr. Hamzawi, um, Hanem Becky with Coptic Orphans. We're a nonprofit based in DC, but we have operations in Egypt. Um, 20 some years ago. And my question is regarding civil society and the registration of international um, NGOs. We submitted our registration in 2005 only to hear in early 2012 that we're two weeks from getting our international registration. April 23rd, we hear from international and local media that we're banned from doing um, any work which is basically helping orphans. <coughs> Um, you know, keeping them in schools because it um, interferes with the sovereignty of Egypt. Now, my question is, what about the civil society um, in terms of the parliament? Is it a priority? How are you facilitating the work of civil society, um, especially that we are a diaspora organization? We're not American or international. We are, we're Egyptians, right? So, and, and what's your stand on the whole sure. thing? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Said Eric I'm from Al Quds uh, Daily Newspaper. My question to you: Could you shed some light on the role of unions, you know, labor unions, uh, teachers unions, you know, women unions, and so on, and how are they likely to, let's say, tip the balance in favor of secular and liberal parties? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ambassador Wahba. Marcel Wahba, thank you for a great presentation this morning. I wanted to switch the subject a little bit to the economy. While the uh, political future of Egypt is obviously a top priority, um, what is going on within parliament in terms of economic policy looking at the future of Egypt? Mm -hmm. I, I, I recognize that a president and a new government will have a lot to say about that. But what are you hearing within sure. either the Islamist or non-Islamist parties and what direction they want to take Egypt? Okay. okay. Last, last set of questions. Sure. Uh, well, on, on, on uh, I mean, let me start uh, with the gentleman's question uh, with regard to, um, to the African dimension uh, of Egyptian politics. And I mean, just to give, to give an example how important the African dimension is becoming and how significant uh, it is in terms of Egyptian public debates. I, mean, I, I was part of a parliamentary delegation which went to uh, Uganda and Ethiopia a couple of weeks ago. And we have scheduled trips to uh, other Nile Basin countries where we are trying to move beyond the negative legacy which the former regime left us with. Uh, high tensions, deterioration in relations with most Nile, Nile Basin countries to the extent that the so-called framework uh, agreement, which uh, if ratified by parliaments is going to be uh, effective, and it's an agreement uh, with regard to the sharing of water resources, that agreement uh, was agreed upon without any Egyptian uh, role or without Egypt 
being part of it. So we are trying to take the African dimension very seriously, and we are establishing uh, friendship uh, associations between our parliament and counterparts in Ethiopia and in Uganda. And uh, um, I'm, 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 I'm part of a small group which is leading that effort, and we are very interested in it. And so, we, so we take it very, very seriously. I mean, Egypt needs to look not simply to uh, the Euro-Mediterranean zone, or of course to the Arab world and the Middle East, but we have to take the African dimension very seriously. And people are eager to hear from us, I and mean, are eager to see the new Egypt, and to see a new parliament, uh, which is democratically elected, and where, uh, thank God, I mean, the former tones of uh, Egyptian sup supremacy are no longer being heard. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a key. Uh, component and uh, we are investing much as parliament in uh, in taking that very seriously on ngos now let me assure you that the, uh, i mean what what do we do as parliament we legislate so uh, we have the draft law uh, finalized in the committee on human rights it will be pushed to the assembly to the floor next week and so we'll see how the scheduling will go uh, that draft law stipulates with regard to foreign uh, organizations. With regard to Egyptian organizations, it's a, a registration by notification. You will no longer wait, very similar to the Tunisian law, you will no longer wait for the Ministry of Social Affairs to give you a license. You notify the ministry that you exist. With regard to foreign uh, organizations, it's a notification. And if the ministry does not get back to you in 30 days, you are registered. If they have any reservations, they will not get back to you. They will have to make a legal case out of it. So we are clearly trying to undermine the ability of the social uh, affairs ministry to undermine uh, your operation as NGOs. So we are moving beyond the legacy of the past, clearly. And the same will apply to foreign funding, notification-based systems, if they would like to object or stop, they should go to an administrative court in charge. And no longer are we going to see uh, decisions taken by the ministry the dissolving NGOs or banning NGOs or banning funding. So it's, it's going to be over. And I have great confidence that that draft law is going to pass the assembly uh, because it, it's an outcome of a consensus building uh, process. On unions, a uh, very good question. Uh, I'm uh, part of an initiative. Uh, which is composed uh, of 10 or 11 MPs. We introduced an, uh, a new bill to uh, uh, grant uh, um, uh, the freedom of formation and operation for unions. I mean, you know, the uh, labor unions as well as trade unions as well as professional associations have been strongly etatized, have been controlled by the state since the 1950s. And then later on, once we had elections in unions, Islamists uh, could win uh, in, 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 uh, in unions greatly. But never was a question addressed about freedom of association for labor unions, for trade unions, and for professional associations. And even the discussion which we have had on NGOs, unions were always out of the picture. Now we are introducing a new, a new law to mandate uh, freedom of association uh, with, for unions so that we will no longer have a so-called general union, uh, general uh, association of Egyptian unions, and one national union for the industry X and Y and Z. So we'll have freedom of association within unions as well. And it's being discussed as of now. So we have, we have two weeks of discussion behind us, and we will continue next week. On the economy, what what is the assembly doing? I mean, I, I, I completely agree that that is going to be the domain for the new president and the new cabinet. And we are in a waiting mode uh, until we have the elected president and the new cabinet. But the assembly is treating, and here is one of my concerns, the assembly is treating economic matters in a highly populist uh, way. So we had, I mean, I objected to those uh, three legislations, pieces of legislation. We passed three of them relevant to the economic situation. One, I mean, the Egyptian state bureaucracy has six million employees. We added one million uh, in a legislation. Uh, appointing uh, temporary workers uh, and making them permanent workers and employees of the state. So we added 700,000 to uh, 6 million state bureaucracy. And no one raised the question. I mean, those who agreed, who approved the piece of legislation driven by populist considerations, no one raised the question, where is the money going to come from? I mean, so what does it imply for the Egyptian budget, which is 
highly uh, in, in, a, in a, I mean, under distress and pressures and so on and so forth. The second piece of legislation was on uh, the minimum wage regulation and a third piece of legislation on the maximum wage regulation in the public sector. And while I am not opposed to minimum or maximum wage regulations, I do not accept that the assembly approved those two pieces without knowing the data, without knowing the number of Egyptians affected, minimum wage or maximum wage, uh, uh, financial resources needed, uh, or financial resources which the budget is going to win, maximum wage regulation. I mean, that lack of uh, detailed and objective treatment and the passing of very relevant pieces of legislation for the economy, uh, clearly driven by populist considerations, is frightening. And uh, I tried with, with, with other MPs to stop them, but of course we could not. I mean, we delayed the process for a couple of weeks, but then we could not stop them. I'm hoping that the new president and the new cabinet will take economic discussions uh, out of that populist uh, narrative in which economic uh, questions have fallen, that populist trap, and where it's basically used to reach out to constituencies in a, in a, in a to my mind, an irrational, politically, public policy-wise, uh, an irrational manner. Amr, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Marwan. You.